Um, welcome everybody to tonight's event of the Opportunity Zones Meetup. My name is Carl Dakin and I will be uh, hosting and presenting tonight. Uh, tonight's topic in the Opportunity Zone area is on profiling investors. Uh, this is uh, what we call step four or stage four in a 10 step process for raising capital. And I'm going to be talking about what's involved in this particular step why it's important, how it fits into opportunity zones, and, and from the standpoint of how do you go about profiling investors who are specifically interested in opportunity zones um, because of their ability to gain tax incentives. So uh, this is one of the hats that I wear as Dakin Capital. I provide uh, coaching and consulting services on the design, staging, and management of capital campaigns. Uh, my services uh, are across Colorado mostly, but also extend into other states and working with a variety of different businesses in different areas of industry and marketplaces. In addition to that, uh, I'm an advisor to Invest New Mexico, uh, where I spent three days last week uh, looking at different projects, both real estate and businesses, and working with some new Opportunity Zone models uh, that I'll talk a little bit more about later in tonight's program uh, to share with you some of the new things we're doing to continue to expand uh, the reach and interest of people in using Opportunity Zones as a way of investing in local communities. Um, then uh, finally, uh, for tonight, uh, I am uh, a partner in a startup business called the Colorado Center for Innovation and Community Capital. Uh, this is, new company uh, takes a different approach to raising money by providing turnkey concierge services uh, where we advance the cost and uh, provide the talent to run a complete capital campaign. This serves to relieve the small business owner from the time, money, and knowledge that they don't have uh, so they can focus on their business and improves the probability of success of the capital campaign. So uh, tonight, uh, as we talk about Opportunity Zones, uh, there are a number of updates that we'll get into. Uh, as many of you uh, may know, uh, in December, the IRS, who is in charge of Opportunity Zones, released their final regulations. And uh, this small 544-page document uh, is actually uh, reaffirms everything we saw in the two sets of proposed regulations that came out in October of 2018 and then uh, in April of last year. Uh, but it also did some interesting uh, extensions in a variety of areas, and some of this I'm still studying, trying to make sure I understand it. Uh, but the, there are a number of things in there that um, I'll point out. Uh, as an example, um, if you are starting a project, uh, you will have a period of time uh, once the money moves from a fund into a business or property uh, development in which to deploy that money, so approximately 31 months. Uh, but uh, they added a new provision that if you are a startup business, that now doubles down to 62 months in which to deploy the money, which uh, is a long time uh, both within the framework of this investment and uh, from the standpoint of most small businesses, but it probably would benefit those businesses most who are engaged in technology development, are still some ways away from reaching cash flow or profitability and need that extra time to try to ramp up what they're doing and doing it with investment dollars targeted for research and development purposes. Uh, there's other things in there and I'll get into more of those at our next session. Um, as I'm trying to make sure that I understand it. But one of the ones I'm looking at is the holding period on abandoned property. It was originally stated that if the property had been abandoned for five years, not in use, that it could be treated as original uh, operation for opportunity zone purposes. And it looks like they may have shortened that to as short as one year uh, so that uh, more and more properties would qualify without requiring that you put in an enhancement or improvements to the property of at least an amount equal to the purchase price. 
Uh, beyond that, uh, we've seen uh, more legislation come into place. Uh, the most recent legislation has to do with uh, the fact that we're going through the census. Uh, we're going to see uh, new population growth and declination in different areas, and that will allow the census tracts to be redrawn. And then the question becomes, since opportunity zones are based on census tracts, what's that going to do to existing projects in motion, and what is it going to potentially do to new areas that may be expanded into a zone that wasn't previously designated as a zone. Um, uh, beyond that, uh, we're seeing more and more people get into opportunity zones. The, uh, there was a dramatic increase in the month of December of 2019 after the final uh, rules came out, and it's expected we're going to see a continual increase in the number of opportunity zone projects going forward. Uh, both within real estate and in uh, what we call businesses, uh, but we're also seeing more communities bring in public-private partnerships and start to frame up projects, which we define as being two or more businesses working in concert with a foundation or local government agency. And these are mostly targeting uh, what we'll call an infrastructure-style projects within a community. Uh, it may have to do with utilities, it may have to do with education, housing, something in the community that may have been on the list of the local government to work on for a long period of time, but the budgets have never been good enough or large enough to allow for that. So opportunity zone investment may step into this gap and fill this going forward. Then uh, as uh, those of you who followed uh, this program and on video or in person, uh, we've been working on a series of different upgrades to opportunity zones these either serve to improve the, research, uh, the return on investment or to mitigate the risk that goes with a particular investment. In either case, it makes it more attractive to investors to consider an investment in opportunity zone uh, where they might not otherwise. And uh, again, investors are continuing to show concern over the 10-year long-term uh, commitment in order to gain the maximum benefit from an opportunity zone. And uh, this is helping to, to mitigate that to some degree. So uh, quickly, uh, one of the things we've been doing is innovation hubs. Uh, this is where we're encouraging real estate developers to add an innovation element that creates a long-term, uh, marketable, agile aspect to the real estate uh, so that uh, it's acting to serve and improve the local community by creating more jobs, which buy more houses, which keep the housing prices up by the time you get to the cash exit in the investment. And um, just talked this afternoon with some people about artificial intelligence as a potential driver. Uh, we have continuing uh, conversations of multiple communities on different things that are fit to those communities that can help them out. We're also looking at workforce housing. I think we're getting very close to a first pilot project where uh, workforce housing is initiated by working with local employers. Uh, we would go to employers within a community we get them to commit to buy out uh, a constructed workforce unit at the end of a 10-year time period. Uh, and with that guaranteed buyout, it gives a level of security to the investors that they can get a particular rate of return with a very low risk that they would lose money in the investment and uh, even with a good chance of making a 75 to 8% average annualized rate of return. Uh, so we're currently talking to multiple uh, communities and in particular real estate developers and builders uh, who have an interest in moving forward their projects but need that little extra something uh, to propel that into action and we think employer participation may make the difference. Um, at this time in our program, uh, we invite people who have a project or fund to stand up here and do a five minute slide deck, talk about their program and where they're at. We don't have anybody scheduled for this evening, but if you have an interest, please contact me. Uh, my information uh, will be on the slide deck, and you'll be able to uh, call or email me and make arrangement to present your particular project. So that brings us to the end of part one of tonight's program. Uh, we'll take a short break. and.